The world is getting dangerous for us who are Christians. There is a new religion emerging that is worrying believers all over the world and they are right to be scared. Those who are not prepared will be destroyed and by the time they realize what is happening it will be too late. For a Christian, saving your soul is a priority and for this new religion destroying your soul is the priority, so you can see why it is so dangerous. That's why you need to be prepared to survive this and be able to live the religion that God taught us and that will be able to save our soul and take us to heaven to be with our Father. In this video we will explain to you what this new religion is, what are the causes and consequences of this frightening phenomenon. And finally, we will teach you how to protect yourself from this new religion and how to remain faithful to God in these difficult times. If you care about your soul and want to be prepared, stay with me until the video of this video and I guarantee you that the information I will share in the next few minutes will make you a better Christian and strong enough to face any difficult time. First, I just ask that you leave a like on the video and check if you are already subscribed to the channel. Let's go to this video with another surprising revelation. In recent years, a striking trend has manifested itself in several parts of the world, a noticeable decline in adherence to religious practices and in links with traditional concepts linked to religion. This change is profoundly impacting the social and cultural structures that have been fundamental to the organization of societies over the centuries. One of the most visible faces of this decline is the decline in attendance at churches, mosques, temples and other places of worship. Sunday, a day that in times past was revered as sacred and reserved for religious activities and spiritual reflection, now often passes like any other day of the week, filled with common tasks and diverse commitments. Unfortunately, it is rare to see families attending church together over multiple generations. Even churchgoers are being influenced by secular culture, resulting in a decrease in fervor and enthusiasm for the Christian faith around us. Unfortunately, we have witnessed an increase in hostility and contempt for the teachings of Christ. Nowadays, it is easy to notice that the ideas of love, compassion and tolerance, which Jesus Christ taught, are being increasingly ignored and even rejected. This is very sad. People seem to be becoming more hostile towards each other, acting with contempt and a lack of respect for others' feelings and beliefs. When we look around us, we see many examples of this. Instead of helping and supporting each other, people are distancing themselves, creating barriers and even fighting over small reasons. They seem to have completely forgotten Christ's teachings about loving your neighbors as yourself and treating others with kindness and compassion. Furthermore, there is the phenomenon of secularism that promotes the separation between religious institutions and the government, limiting the influence of religion on politics and laws. This phenomenon promotes secular values, such as human rights, social justice, and democracy, as guides for ethical and moral living, rather than relying exclusively on religious teachings. This can lead people to prioritize these values over religious institutions and decrease their participation in organized religion. Amid this worrying scenario, many people claim that religion is dying. However, stating that religion is dying is not a fair assessment. Religion is alive and well. What has changed are people's priorities. Nowadays, people are more concerned with seeking personal benefits than with humbly serving God and others. Religion is still present, but its fundamental purpose is no longer the love of God and neighbor. I have to admit that a new religion is gaining strength in people's lives nowadays. This religion contradicts the values and teachings of previous generations and even the teachings of Christ, which we value so much. This new emerging religion is a religion of self. The religion of self is when a person focuses too much on themselves, their desires and happiness, rather than following a traditional religion or belief system. The individual decides what is right or wrong without worrying about religious dogmas. In the religion of self, people primarily seek their own happiness and personal growth. They can do this through things like meditation to get to know themselves better, or positive thoughts to attract success and prosperity. Not that these things are wrong, it has been proven that meditation is good for the brain as well as positive thinking, the issue here is when you forget everything that religion teaches and live your life only based on these concepts, forgetting the Bible, of Jesus' teachings, ignoring the importance of having an active spiritual life and completely forgetting that we are immortal beings because we have a soul that at the end of everything will be judged and can be taken to heaven or hell. 
And this is very worrying and I want you to stay tuned so we can reflect together on the consequences of this decline in religion. Many churches and Christians today claim that their main goal is to honor Christ, but is this really true? Many are convinced that they are putting Christ first in their lives, but in subtle ways this emerging religion of self has been growing since the times when Eve was deceived in the garden. It is very worrying to see the number of Christians who have been contaminated with this selfish vision. Many people seek to hear things from the Bible that make them feel good, but they rarely stop to consider whether these things are truly Christian. Both believers and non-believers today seem to agree on one thing, what really matters in life is the pursuit of happiness. For believers, it is essential to remember that the true Christian message is not just about seeking personal happiness, but rather about following the teachings of Christ, which often challenge conventional notions of comfort and self-satisfaction. The Christian path involves sacrifice, a commitment to justice and compassion for those in need, sometimes to the detriment of one's own comfort and happiness. In Matthew 16 verses 24 to 26 we have a clear and objective warning. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake cause, he will find it. For what good will it be for a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? In these verses, Jesus is instructing his disciples on what it means to truly follow him. He emphasizes that following Christ is not a journey of comfort and self-satisfaction, but rather a journey of sacrifice and renunciation of ego. He challenges his followers to deny themselves, to take up their cross, and to follow him. If you believe this, leave a comment saying, Amen, show the world that you are a follower of Jesus and that there is no shame in that, on the contrary, we are acting according to our nature, we are children following the advice of our Father. This passage highlights the importance of total commitment to Christ, even if it means giving up worldly conveniences and pleasures. Jesus warns that those who seek to preserve their own lives, prioritizing their own interests and pleasures, will eventually lose them. In contrast, those who are willing to lose their lives for the sake of Christ will find true life in communion with Him. These verses remind us that true discipleship involves renunciation and sacrifice, but it also promises an eternal reward that transcends the fleeting riches of this world. It is a call to a radical faith that places Christ at the center of our lives and leads us to seek His will above all else. This teaching is extremely unpopular today. The religion of self teaches that happiness is achieved by satisfying one's own dreams and comforts. While this idea may seem appealing at first glance, it is subtly contrary to the fundamental principles of Christ's ministry. It's difficult to convince someone to put God first in a society that constantly emphasizes the opposite. People are inundated with advertisements encouraging the search for new things, increasing pressure at work to achieve more and more success, or songs that glorify happiness above what is correct and healthy. When people continue to live with this internal focus and lose sight of God, the result is always a feeling of emptiness. When we give ourselves over to the incessant pursuit of worldly pleasures, we run the risk of placing our personal desires above the principles and values taught by Jesus. Instead of following the path of ego renunciation and service to others, we become consumed by a mentality of instant gratification, where what matters is the search for the next pleasure or indulgence. This hedonistic mentality distances us from the example of Christ, who called us to carry our cross and follow in his footsteps. Instead of committing to ego sacrifice and renunciation, we become increasingly selfish and self-centered. This prevents us from developing a true and meaningful connection with Jesus because we are too busy pursuing our own desires and pleasures to focus on his call to a life of holiness and service. Furthermore, the search for pleasure often leads us to moral and ethical deviations, leading us to make decisions that contradict the teachings of Jesus. Instead of living according to the principles of love, justice and compassion, we can find ourselves engaging in harmful and destructive behaviors that affect not only ourselves but also those around us. Consider the wisdom we find in Proverbs 30 verses 7 to 9. This excerpt teaches us two important things, I have asked you two things, do not deny me before I die, keep away from me vanity and false words, give me neither poverty nor riches, give me only the bread that I need lest, when he is full, he denies himself, and says, Who is the Lord? 
Or, being poor, he steals, and takes the name of God in vain. In this brief excerpt we see a teaching that can change our lives because it reflects deeply on human nature and the relationship with God. The first part is a request to be kept from vanity and lies. Vanity, here, is not just about the search for admiration or ostentation, but also the illusion of self-sufficiency and the search for meaning in fleeting things. Here there is a recognition of the tendency of the human heart to stray from the truth and engage in lies, whether to mask weaknesses, gain unfair advantages, or even to protect ourselves from the consequences of our own mistakes. Therefore, we see the cry to God for righteousness and integrity in His words and actions, recognizing that lying is contrary to the nature of God and harmful to fellowship with Him. Then there is another singular request to God, that He grant Him neither extreme poverty nor abundant riches, but just enough for His daily subsistence. This plea is profoundly wise, for it recognizes the dangers of both scarcity and excess. In extreme poverty, there is the risk of despair and temptation to resort to dishonest means to survive, while in abundant wealth, there is the danger of arrogance, self-reliance, and forgetfulness of God. Here we see a search for a balanced life, where his dependence on God is evident in all circumstances, and where he is not tempted to deny God, whether through abundance or scarcity. These verses invite us to reflect on our own lives and priorities. They remind us of the importance of truth and integrity in our words and actions, as well as the need to trust God for our daily provision, avoiding the extremes that keep us from true communion with Him. May we learn from the wisdom of these words and seek a life of balance, righteousness and trust in God. Ego culture urges us to endlessly seek more each year. When a new popular car model comes out, people go to great lengths to purchase it. Likewise, every year a new cell phone model appears, and people count every penny to ensure they are one of the first to have this new device. But how often do we stop to consider that the car and cell phone we already own are perfectly fine? Why are we never satisfied? The reason is that many feel they deserve the latest items on the market, often being so self-centered that they ignore larger concerns in life. The desire for material goods is an empty search for happiness, which never truly satisfies anyone. The Bible teaches us that true happiness and contentment are found by seeking God above all else. God offers spiritual wealth that surpasses any earthly luxury. Is it worth sacrificing our integrity and desecrating God's name by living like thieves just to satisfy our material desires? The answer is a clear no. So our priority should be to ask God for just the right amount of things we want and need, and to be content with whatever amount He chooses to give us. If our needs are met and we are satisfied, where should we direct our affections? The answer given in Matthew 6 verse 33 is simply to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This contrasts with the egocentric teaching that preaches the quest to build a kingdom for ourselves. Jesus is teaching that we must seek a life in accordance with religious principles and values, prioritizing love for others, justice, mercy and fidelity to God. Contentment is not achieved through the pursuit of our own greatness, but rather through building the kingdom of God. Our focus should be on God's will, not ours. Giving up our selfish ambitions and submitting ourselves completely to Christ is the true purpose of life. Continuing with our main text, Jesus' words in Matthew 16 warn us against self-promotion. In verses 25 and 26, he says that whoever tries to save his own life will end up losing it, but whoever loses it for his sake will find it. What's the point of gaining the whole world and losing your own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? In a world where many prioritize their own survival above all else, the Bible challenges us with a profound and sometimes disconcerting truth. Giving up our selfish desires in favor of God's will may seem counterintuitive at first, but it brings with it happiness and a peace that transcends any human understanding. The decision to renounce even our own life is the secret to unveiling the genuine purpose that lives within each of us. While the world encourages us to seek satisfaction in our own interests, our Savior's message echoes clearly, it is in the willingness to let go of our own desires that we discover who we really are and the greater purpose that awaits us. This transformation is only possible when we recognize that our identity finds its fulfillment in Christ. When we give Him the place of leadership in our lives, we understand that our value does not lie in ourselves, but in Him. Perhaps someone will wonder, so you are suggesting that my own safety doesn't matter to God? 
that I should be ready to sacrifice everything for him? It is essential to understand that, although God cares for us with love and blesses us, he is not bound to protect us from all adversity. His action is motivated by love, not obligation. We must be aware that he may allow us to face challenges, trials, and even the loss of our lives, all to manifest his glory. How we receive and respond to this truth reveals how much we have been shaped by the prevailing self-centered mindset. May we ponder the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 verses 7 to 10. Paul shares about his thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan who afflicted him. And, so that I would not be puffed up with the greatness of the revelations, a thorn was placed in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, so that I would not be exalted. About which three times I prayed to the Lord that he would depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will most gladly glory in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell within me. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in insults, in needs, in persecutions, in anguish, for the love of Christ. Because when I am weak, then I am strong. He pleaded with the Lord for his removal three times, but the answer he received was that God's grace was sufficient, for his power is made perfect in weakness. Thus, Paul learned to rejoice in his weaknesses, because it is in weakness that divine strength manifests itself most intensely. Throughout the Bible, we witness men and women of God who faced living conditions far inferior to ours. It is a saga of courage and devotion, where God's people were often despised, enduring not only rejection but also physical pain and sometimes even loss of life. In contrast to the modern era, where few are willing to endure adversity for their faith, even fewer to accept physical harm or sacrifice themselves. Even now, as I claim to be a follower of Christ, the thought of losing my life or suffering for my faith seems frightening. This is something I need to work on, and I'm sure I'm not alone. As we read the scriptures, we find indications that God wants us to adjust our priorities. We must ask ourselves whether we are more concerned with ourselves or God's purpose. We reflect on how God allowed even the most remarkable servants, such as the Apostle Paul and Job, to face challenges that seemed insurmountable. Paul, with his thorn in the flesh, and Job, who lost everything, including his health, teach us that afflictions can be instruments in the hands of the Creator to keep us humble and dependent on Him. Even though we cry out for relief, sometimes God chooses to sustain us through the storms rather than pull us out of them. What does this mean for us today? It means that security was never a divine promise. We are called to be willing to sacrifice our own lives, if necessary, in obedience to God's call. Even if the reasons escape us, our obligation is to obey, trusting that the Lord's plan transcends our limited understanding. As the world urges us to seek our own happiness and pursue our own desires, we are reminded that true purpose lies in submitting our lives to the will of the Almighty. We must resist the temptation to place ourselves above our Savior and instead place our unshakable hope and trust in God, who guides us through life's uncertainties. On our journey, we are encouraged to embrace joy and gratitude no matter what life has in store for us. As Paul teaches us in 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 16 to 18, we should find reasons to always rejoice, maintain a constant connection with God through prayer, and express gratitude in every situation, for this is the divine will for us in Jesus Christ. Following these words empowers us to face life's challenges with hope and faith. Romans 1 verse 16 reminds us not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a powerful source of salvation for all who believe. As children of God, we must proudly embrace our faith, boldly proclaiming our belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we feel hesitant to share our faith with others, worried about what they might think. But we should not be afraid to affirm our confidence in the promise that one day we will be with the Lord forever. For, as the scriptures tell us, believers will be reunited with the Lord in heaven, and this is a reason for great hope and comfort. Therefore, we should not be afraid to talk about our faith, even if it may cause discomfort. For when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we find not only eternal life, but also the true peace and fullness that only He can offer. My brother, are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you ashamed to tell our friends and family that we all need to turn to Jesus Christ and repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand? We should not feel ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. 
We live in a world where deceitful voices try to keep us from the path of Jesus. But it is time to rise up as followers of Christ and proclaim that there is hope in the midst of chaos. Jesus is our liberator, the one who offers life in abundance. We must not be afraid to proclaim this truth. Rather, we must come together as a spiritual family and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Just as Paul, a fervent follower of Jesus, stated, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. So I encourage you to be brave. While the world tries to silence us, we must speak even louder. As Christians, we have a responsibility to share the message of hope and salvation that we find in Jesus. We cannot hide, on the contrary, we must courageously proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, don't let anyone shut you up. Share the love of Jesus without fear. He has promised us that if we trust in him, we will find peace in the midst of our trials. And when the struggles seem too great, remember that you are not alone. The Holy Spirit is with us, strengthening and guiding us at all times. I believe the reason we should not allow our hearts to be troubled can be found in John 14 verse 6, where Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If we continue reading John 14 verse 16, the Bible states, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever. From these verses, we understand that by accepting Jesus Christ into our hearts, we welcome him who is the way, the truth, and the life. There is nothing he cannot control, nothing he does not know. He is the answer, the solution to all things. Furthermore, by giving us the wonderful Holy Spirit as our helper, we have help in times of trouble, strength in times of weakness, and guidance in times of uncertainty. Therefore, do not allow your heart to be troubled. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and have submitted to his authority in your heart, you are under the care of the Good Shepherd. Thank you very much for watching this video until the end. Share with me in the comments what lesson you learned from this video. Remember to like, subscribe to the channel if you are not already subscribed and turn on notifications to be notified when we post new videos. Stay with God until the next video.